Hi, everybody. Welcome to our first ever Book Up at Home live author visit. I'm Jordan Smith from, I'm the Deputy Director at the National Book Foundation. And what we do at the foundation year round is work to connect readers, like those of you tuning in today with books that we think you'll be excited about. And one of the ways that we do this is through our Book Up program, which for over a decade has worked with schools and community centers and other partners to send our teaching artists who are all published authors into the classroom to run reading clubs for middle school students, high school students, to connect you guys with books, to visit libraries, to visit bookstores. Obviously this year in pandemic life, things are looking a little bit different. And instead of connecting in person, we're connecting here in this virtual space. We really, really miss being able to come be with you in person, but we are also very excited that we have this technology that allows us to do some new and exciting things this year. Um, we're able to connect you directly with some really great authors um, and for you to ask questions of them and to hear straight from them about their work and their books. And we're also able to open up this event to students who aren't just in our book up program with our partner sites, but um, to any middle and high school students around the country who are interested in joining us. So we're really excited um, to make that an opportunity. Um, before we get started, a very quick word of thanks um, to our funders, the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York State Council on the Arts, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. I also wanted to thank all of our teachers and community partners who have helped connect their students with today's events. But most of all, I wanted to thank all of the young people who are tuning in today. It's a crazy time uh, to be alive. And I'm really delighted that you've all made the choice to make some time for books and reading in your life. Um, and I'm super excited to share today's author visit with you. We are really excited to be joined today by author Lillian Rivera. William's based in Los Angeles. She's a writer and a creative writing teacher. And I have to give some shout outs because she also was a teaching artist for our book up program at Fauché Learning Center in LA. So shout out to Fauché if any of our uh, Fauché kids are listening right now. Um, Lillian is the author of several young adult and middle grade novels, including Dealing in Dreams, Goldie Vance. She's also, uh, her, re her most recent young adult novel, Never Look Back, um, was just published this September. She's the author of the novel, The Education of Margot Sanchez. And so for those students who are part of our book up program, you'll either have already received this from your school or your community center, or you'll be getting a copy soon. And if you're just joining us from the public, please check out at your library or local bookstore, uh, Lilliam's work. You definitely don't want to miss it. Um, so today we'll be focusing a little bit on Margot Sanchez, but also on, we'll have a chance to hear from Lilliam about her work um, in general. Um, you'll have a chance to ask questions in the chat box, uh, so please use that function if there's anything that you want to ask. Uh, we'll be hearing from Lillian, and then we'll come back together for a Q&A. Um, so now I'm delighted to turn it over to Lillian. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much, um, Jordan and the National Book Awards Foundation. Um, just as Jordan had mentioned, I used to uh, lead book up uh, readings at uh, Fauché for three years and um, it kind of broke my heart to not be able to do it this year because I, I loved um, I love meeting with the kids and I love talking about books and getting excited about what we're going to read and having you know having them decide what we're going to read and so uh, big love to Fauché I, I miss a lot of the students there and and also just doing it was like that was a big deal for me and inspired me and my work um, so I am going to do a very quick presentation. I'll just talk about my life as a writer, where I came from, um, and um, all that good stuff. And then um, what I really would love, if you have any questions for me, I will gladly help. I will gladly answer any questions, all questions in regards to reading, writing, uh, graphic novels, comic books, all those things, because I write all those things. <laughs> and, and I love it, and I love what I do. So. Um, I think we could start off with this. Yeah, there I am. There's nerdy Lilium <laughs> wearing glasses as I still do today. Um, so yes, I, you know, I am a writer and author. I am originally from the Bronx, New York. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever been to the Bronx. I know that we have um, our big things. Well, now we're known for way more things, but back in the day we were, it was uh, Yankee Stadium, the Bronx Zoo, 
and um, all this other horrible, uh, really bad stereotypes, kind of uh, uh, cliches about what living in the Bronx was like. But I am from, I'm a product of the Bronx, New York. I'm very proud of being from the Bronx. And it literally just, it does influence the kind of writing that I do. So, um, so yes, I'm sh I was a shy, nerdy girl um, that took the pens and paper. Okay, let's uh, move on to the next slide. <laughs> Yeah, so as I, we were talking about, right, the Bronx is uh, known for way more things now, right? So we have Cardi B. I don't know how you feel about Cardi B. I like Cardi B. I like that she's uh, herself and does not shy in any kind of way. Uh, but we also have AOC, which is like the biggest, like, well-known politician out there. She's Puerto Rican from the Bronx. What I love about AOC, too, is that I think last night she was playing Twitch, like video games with a bunch of people. Who does that? <laughs> like to me, no politician is doing that except for AOC. And then I had the great pleasure of meeting and 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 being in conversation with the Supreme Court Justice uh, Sonia Sotomayor, who is also Puerto Rican and from the Bronx. So here are these three kind of powerful women that are are leading the way. And also, I, just a shout, a side shout out or a side note is that if you guys haven't seen the movie. Vampires uh, versus the Bronx. It's on Netflix and it is hilarious and funny and good. And it's not scary at all, but it's great. And it's set, it's filmed in the Bronx and it's just one of my favorite and is filmed and directed by uh, a Dominican uh, uh, director, Oz Rodriguez. So I don't know, shout out to the Bronx, 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 Bronx. Okay, so let's go, <laughs> let's go to the other uh, slide. Thank you. So this is literally where I grew up. This is the projects. Um, where I live in Los Angeles, I know there are some housing projects here, but they don't look as they don't look as the ones that I that I grew up in in New York. And this was called the, um, the they were called for me they were called the Wester Avenue projects, although that's not what their real names were. Um, and there were like three big buildings connected into these like floors, you know, that kind of just connected. And I grew up there with my five brothers and sisters and an older sister. And my father, my father worked as a nurse's aide in a hospital in, uh, in Manhattan. And my mom was a stay-at-home mom for the most part until she started working in the cafeteria at the elementary school that I used to, that I attended, which is not even a few blocks away. But the, this project was really my home. And because I was a, a supremely like shy person, I mean, I had really kind of long hair like I do now, but I had really long bangs that covered my face. And I really didn't talk to anyone. Like I would talk so low that a lot of people, even my family would have to scream at me to speak up. Um, I was extremely shy. So I would spend most of my time looking out the window. Like I would look out the window from these projects as I see everyone hanging out downstairs, playing games or, you know, or, uh, you know, street games, whatever, um, kick the can or, you know, hide and seek, all those things. And I, I didn't participate. I was just way too quiet and too shy. I would stay home. And what I would mostly do would read. I would read a lot. Like I had a mother who was, I was blessed with who would walk us, my brothers and I, to the library. And it was like a 10 or 15 blocks away. You know, it wasn't close, but we would walk to the library and we would read. And I, that's really where I began my love for literature was through, was through those visits of, of being in the library. And I would devour books nonstop, nonstop. Uh, next slide, please. So eighth grade Lilium, another nerdy picture of me. Look at those glasses. I kind of want to rock them now, <laughs> but this is uh, the reason why I show I I I uh, have this picture is because um, eighth grade. These are these are pictures that I had of myself after eighth grade. Um, there are no more pictures of me, and I was no longer smiling, and I was literally those bangs were covering my face, and I would wear dark clothes and I would have really black eyeliner and I was looking like a, a goth girl before goth girls were even a thing and um I was just really sh just really an introspective kind of like shy person who the only way I could deal with anything was through writing was through reading and writing 
So if I had any kind of drama or if I felt I wasn't being seen or heard, which was a lot of times, I would write. And I would have all these journals everywhere um, where I would just continuously write about things that I didn't understand, about any kind of violence that I was witnessing, about any happiness that I might have you know, felt at the time. I was just writing, writing it in my journal and I would just keep it to myself. I wouldn't share any of my work with anybody. But it was really my way of coping. It was my way of finding strength through my words somehow. So that little picture of Lilium was a picture of her happiness before she really kind of closed in a little bit more and more. Okay, next slide, thank you. So my favorite books when I was growing up or in high school was The Outsiders by S.E. Hinton. I don't know if you guys have to read it. I think they still have, they allow uh, a lot of students still read them or it's in the syllabus, right, on the syllabus. Um, the Outsiders by S.E. Hinton was a big deal because she was really young when she wrote that book. Um, I love that it's about gangs. I love that it's about a formed family. It's a family of your choosing. Um, I kind of fell in love with Pony Boy in a way. <laughs> and then I also read Judy Bloom's Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, which is a uh, you know, coming of age story. It felt very real. Judy Bloom is still writing novels to this day. She, has an, she owns a bookstore in Florida. I'm just in awe of her career. And then I also read C.S. Uh, Lewis's uh, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which was a fantastical book. Um, and it was one of those books that I was just like, I wish I had that. You know, I wanted my closet to open up and I could walk through it and then I could find myself in a different world. Like, I really would have loved that, you know? So I would always read these kind of fantastical wor works besides the, the S.E. Hittens and the Judy Blooms. I wanted to read about Martians and adventures and gangs and all these kind of things that make sense to me. And even though a lot of the times, most of these w work or most of these um, books didn't, I couldn't relate to because I didn't I didn't live in suburbia. I didn't live in a house. I lived in the projects in the Bronx in the city. And sometimes I would read them and they felt very like I was reading a science fiction in a way. Um, but I loved it. I was just like, I envisioned the characters as being brown and black. I envisioned Puerto Rican girls kind of being in gangs. I envisioned uh, young black girls coming of age. I envisioned these kids going through a closet and discovering a whole, completely whole world. I envisioned those, I saw that. When I read them, they became my own. So um, it's really just the beginning of what I knew would be my, my calling in a way, you know, being a writer. Uh, we could go to the next one. Thank you. So there's this quote that Sonia Manzano, who you might know her. I mean, you obviously should know her because if you ever watched uh, Sesame Street, she is Maria on Sesame, Sesame Street. So we all grew up. I know I did. Grew up watching her um, on Sesame Street. And she's a uh, Puerto Rican and she um, originally from the Bronx too. And she wrote a, a, this young adult book called Becoming Maria. And it's a memoir and it really just kind of uh, chronicles her life before she became Maria on Sesame Street. And her, she came from an abusive kind of uh, father was a, a, an alcoholic and, you know, she was growing up during the 60s, 70s. And oh, I love this quote that she says, because I could relate so much to it, is that I grew up wondering how I was going to contribute to a society that didn't see me because I felt invisible. And that's really how I felt a lot of ways when I was really young, because I didn't see myself on the bookshelves, you know, as much as I could flip it and, and envision myself in there, in these characters, I, I craved to see someone that looked like me or looked like my family or looked like my cousin, you know? And I so related to what um, Sonia was saying in this is that why weren't there enough books out there with uh, people who looked like me? who spoke of, like me, who grew up in the, in the environments that I grew up in. Next slide, please. So of course we're talking about lack of representation in publishing. And I was, you know, I was bored of seeing the same faces, the voices being lifted. <laughs> Sometimes you just get tired of, of the same things. And I know I do, because that's why I, I was so excited when I watched the movie the other day, 
uh, Vampires versus the Bronx. I'm like, here are these three young brown and black kids who I, they look so familiar to me. And here they are, they're the ones who are trying to fight off the vampires. I'm like, I want that. You know, I want to see that for my kids as well. So I believe, like I said, that I believe there's a belief that my voice was needed above all else, that I have stories within me that I no longer should just contain it in the journal, that I needed to bring them out into, into the world because I felt that they needed to hear my voice, that young people needed to read my stories. And that I know, I just knew in the back of my mind, I just knew that I could reach at least one person, that that'll be that my stories are are valid and worthy to be published. So, we start the next one. Thank you. So I start. So I decided that I was going to write a novel, and I was going to you know write about my home, about being from the Bronx. Um, it was going to be coming of age, so it was like like a, a Judy Bloom book or an Essie Hinton book, right? I was going to write about this young girl who. Uh, has to work at her father's supermarket in the South Bronx because she gets caught stealing his credit card to buy clothes that for her fancy school that she goes she attends to. And it was going to be a coming of age story, but it was also going to be talking about gentrification, about addiction, about not about denying yourself. For example, she because she wanted to fit in so so desperately, she would straighten out her hair instead of letting her hair do its beautiful thing of being curly. <laughs> and so I really, I wanted to, you know, I wrote about this story and I did it in 90 days, which is very, very fast. And I don't recommend it for anyone, but I just felt like if I didn't put myself on a deadline, that I, I would never do it. And I had to do it. I felt like it was like, a, I was like, if I didn't do this, then, now, then I'll never be able to. Like, it was a dream for me to be published. And I was like, I'm determined to try, at least try. So I forced myself to write a draft of a novel in 90 days. I would write every single day during those day, those 90 days. And not only, I was only trying to write only for myself. Like, I kept on thinking, what kind of book do I, would I have loved to have read if I were young, if I was that girl looking in, you know, in the library looking for a book to read next? What kind of book would I have read? Oh, you know, and so I kept on thinking in that way and I forced myself to write an, a draft of the novel. And this was a long time ago. I would say seven, seven or eight years ago when I try to do this experiment. <laughs> okay, the next slide. Ah. Look at that. And then all of a sudden I wrote all these books. No, that's not true. What happened was that I, um, I did. I wrote that draft in 90 days, maybe seven years ago. And then I had to rewrite it. And then rewriting is a whole long process. And it took me years. And I, during the course of doing that, I would take classes on how to write, how to write fiction, how to write young adult, oh, excuse me, how to write young adult, how to, um, how to um, you know, I would just take classes all the time. And then I would read a bunch of books. And then finally, when I felt like the, the novel was ready to be seen, and then I went out and I got an agent and then, you know, all this stuff. And then I had to rewrite it. And it's all rewriting. Oh, my God, so much rewriting. <laughs> but in the course of that time, I was like, look, I was able to do it. I got a deadline. I forced myself to do it, even though I didn't know what I was doing half the time. And then I, you know, and then I reworked it and reworked it and I shared it with other writers and I asked them for advice. And then, I, um, and then I kept on, and I kept on going. And then now that book came out. This is a book, I still have it. When did this book come out? I don't even remember. It's, it hasn't been that long. <laughs> but it came out, it's in Spanish now. It could, you could actually read it in Spanish, which is awesome. And, um, and, um, and then I've been, and my latest book is um, Never Look Back, right? This is another one which is the one that just came out in last month. And those, those three books, Never Look Back, Dealing in Dreams, and The Education of Margot Sanchez are all books, books based in the Bronx, New York. The Education of Margot Sanchez is a coming of age story. Dealing in Dreams is a dystopian story where girl gangs rule the streets. It's also set in the Bronx, but you can't really tell unless you're from there. And then Never Look Back is a retelling of the Greek myth Orpheus and Eurydice set in the Bronx with a displaced Puerto Rican 
named Yuri, who meets and falls in love with Fierce, who's a wannabe bachata singer. And then they have to, he ends up having to travel the underworld to rescue her. So if you ever read the myth Orpheus and Eurydice, you'll know what I'm talking about. And those are the three books. And then Goldie Vance is a middle grade book. And that's based off of comic books, uh, Goldie Vance. And this is a mystery. And she's a, a biracial, uh, gay mystery writer, you know, mystery solver who wants to be a detective. And it's set in the 1960s. It's really fun and really cute. And that was a lot of fun to write. So she's not from the Bronx, but <laughs> everything else is. And anyway, what I do is that I, I love writing. I love writing. Um, I love being able to sell these stories. But like I said, it wasn't, I had to overcome this idea of like my voice wasn't needed or, or I didn't deserve a space in the bookshelves. I had to overcome the idea of like, maybe I would never get published. First, I had to write for myself. And then, and then it's a matter of like, I have a story I want to tell, and then hopefully someone else will like it. And that's really what I'm, I'm hoping for. Uh, I think we can go to the next slide. Let's see. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, Never Look Back is about the retelling of the Orpheus and Eurydice. And these are the two people who I imagine in my head they might look like. Um, Romeo Santos is a bachata singer. He's actually from the Bronx. Uh, Dominican, and so I imagined Fierce as being uh, a sort of like a Romeo Santos, and I listened to a lot of uh, Romeo when I was writing the book, and I actually have a playlist that's up on Spotify. If you follow Moonberry uh, Publishing, you can see the playlist, and it's really good. <laughs> um, the next slide. Okay, so these are my tips. Not that they're great tips, but they're tips, okay? So for me, if you want to do, if you want to pursue any kind of uh, creative life, it doesn't matter if you want to be a writer, an, an author, a musician, an artist, whatever it is that you want to do creatively, um, you have to follow these rules. <laughs> you have to, you can't give up. You can't give up before the miracle happens. I can't tell you how many times I would um, really believe that I was never going to get published. I would, I think I was crying in the car. I'll never forget. I was crying to my friends in a car saying, it's never going to happen. What am I going to do? And she was like, what are you talking about? You love to write. <laughs> she just reminded me, like, this is what I do. You love to write. So published or not published, you'll find a way. So um, don't deny your people your greatness because you are. Um, I, that's one thing that I always forget because I have self-doubt and I wake up with self-doubt and I doubt myself and I doubt my creative, my talents and my gift. And um, so I deny people that gift and you should never do that. This is a gift and you have, you're irresponsible to, uh, to shine, to shine. So hang out with the winners. That's what I always do. I like to hang out with people who are doing creative stuff, just like me. And I get inspired by them and I get to listen to what they're doing. And I know that their work inspires me. And then when the door opens, when you have your, your moments of shining, um, when the door opens, you sneak your whole crew in. Um, that's my, my job is to help others who, who don't know what, what the path is like to go, to be a published author, then I will help them as much as I can, or even to just share whatever it is that I, I that I know I, I do because that's my job. And really those are the only tips you should do. <laughs> and also just sit down and write or sit down and create, you know, dedicate time for your art because most people will not give you time. <laughs> they will not but you want to be able to dedicate time for, uh, to have you to, you know, to make your art, to grow your art and to cultivate it. Um, and I think that's it for my slideshow. Is that it? Let's see any more slides. That's it. <laughs> I think that's it. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's my little talk. I will gladly answer all any and all questions you may have of me. Um, you could ask me about bad bunny. I love him as a musician. Or Romeo Santos, you could ask me about writing or anything you'd like to ask me. <laughs> but thank you for uh, letting me, let, hearing me out from uh, the virtual world. <laughs> thank you so much, Lilium. That was really cool. And I, I especially enjoyed seeing your teenage pictures. And I think <laughs> you should definitely return the bangs and the glasses at some point, even if just for like <laughs> Halloween. Um, I should. <laughs>
<laughs> so I just want to remind anybody who's watching, as Lillian said, she's here to answer your questions. So please use the chat function to type those questions in and they'll get sent over to us. Um, we'll make sure Lillian gets to answer the, answering them. Um, but I do have a, a few questions that I'll start off with as we, as we wait. Um, so you talked a little bit about your own teenage years and, and, and Margot being in this sort of own coming of age moment. So I'm curious how much like your own growing up experience influenced that character. Did you take pieces of her or take pieces of yourself into her or is she a brand new invention? And what was that, that process like? Yeah. Um, I really believe that every character that I write is an extension of me. So everyone in, in the education of Margot Sanchez, from Margot Sanchez to her brother, to even her, you know, her parents, they're all kind of like branches of, of, of myself and what I may have dealt with or what I dealt with in the past or what I'm dealing with now. So with Margot Sanchez, she came to me. Um, she's a little bit of a spoiled person. You know, she's kind of sheltered. And she's going to have to deal with working with people. <laughs> she's working in a supermarket. She, she thinks she's not about that life, but she's going to have to learn that she is going to be about that life. And it's a quick, and it's a quick learn. Like, <laughs> so, um, and I love that because I felt I wasn't like that. I didn't grow up privileged at all. As you can tell by the image that I, I showed you of the projects I grew up for. And, um, but I had to be in these environments where I didn't, that I had to, you know, navigate, you know, a lot of places like going to college. I was the first one to go to college. I was the first one to, you know, to work. <laughs> and, you know, as a kid, like I was just like, I would be in environments where I felt like I didn't belong. And so how do you, what do you do? You know, I, I would try on different masks to make myself feel like I belong. And that's what Margot does. She really does kind of try on different masks, like she's gonna deny her curls, she's going to talk a certain way, she's not gonna talk, you know, she's not gonna share what she really loves. And, you know, and I think I went through a period of time when I would do that. I mean, now I don't, cause I'm old, but I just, I would deny a lot about what I, what made me special, I think. And so, yeah. <laughs> Great. All right, I got some questions coming in. Um, our first question is from Isla, who is asking, growing up in the Bronx, did you ever feel out of place? Hmm. I did feel out of place growing up in the Bronx. Um, but I would feel out of place because I would, like I said, I would like certain things. And then maybe my even my cousins would think like, why are you trying to be white? <laughs> you know, I would like new wave music or I would like, Everybody was either into hip hop or salsa music. And sometimes I, I, I like both of those things, but I also would like new wave music and the, or pop music. And my, my family would be like, why? <laughs> they were like, why? Who, why are you trying to be something you're not? You know, so it was just like this weirdness of not trying, like just trying to cultivate a person, your personality. You're just trying to figure out who you are. And so that sometimes would go against my family. And my family was a big deal. You know, they all live in the same neighborhood. They still do. They all live in the same neighborhood. They all hang out, they party together. And so it was a very close knit family, but also felt very, um, you know, they had their own rules of what made sense. And sometimes that didn't work with the way I wanted to live my life. So yeah, that was, so I did, I didn't feel, I felt left, like weirdly left out in some ways, but now I don't. I mean, I love the Bronx. It's fine. It's different. <laughs> Talking about music is actually the perfect segue to another question we got from Yamaris, which is what's your favorite song? Oof. Oh man. We can do like bands say. or singer if song is too hard to yeah. <laughs> nail down. Um, I was just listening, you know, I, I already said I love Bad Bunny. If you guys, I mean, if you're a Bad Bunny fan, you know that he did a live concert in the Bronx on a truck driving through the Bronx and then he went to Washington Heights and then he ended up in Harlem. And I was watching it and I was literally crying because I was like the most magical thing I could have seen during this pandemic. <laughs> it's like him in the Bronx on a truck and all these kids 
on bikes following him. I was just like, this is surreal and dystopian and, and beautiful. <laughs> so I love Bad Bunny. I also love this, um, you know, I, because I was listening to a lot of bachata music, I listened to a lot of Romeo Santos. I also listened to a lot of John uh, Siriano, I think his name is, or Juan Siriano. Um, just a lot of like bachata music, which I still, I follow a lot of bachata dancers because I, I love the way, I love that dance. <laughs> so I listen to, and I, you know, I listen to a lot of hip hop, but I, you know, I'm always falling back into like kind of who's playing what. So right now it's Bad Bunny and um, Romeo Santos. Great. Okay, we've got a couple of questions about writing as well. And Eric is asking, when you have writer's block, what strategies do you use to sort of clear your mind and push forward in your writing process? Uh, I am, I don't like to use the word writer's block. I don't know why, but I do have a, I'm, I'm stuck even right now, today. <laughs> I was like, I try to write every day and I'm on deadline and I, um, have, I have a, pro you know, not a problem. I'm just stuck. So what do I do? Oof, I, I pray a lot. No, I'm kidding. What I do is I write. I write uh, a fear list. It's a, it's a list of, of all my fears. And I write, it, I write down exactly what I'm going through. Like, how do, you know, I, I'm afraid that I'm never going to finish this novel. I'm afraid I'm going to miss the deadline. I'm afraid I'm, I don't have enough words. I, I'm afraid I'm repeating myself. I go on and on and on. And then... Um, and then after I do the fear list and then I literally just rip up the page or I delete the word document and then I hopefully let go of this fear and then I go back to the page and try again. And sometimes if that doesn't work, it's usually if I'm stuck, my characters feel lost. I feel lost too. Like I'm feeling lost just as they're feeling lost. And that's usually how what happens. Um, so I have to go back to the characters and I have to ask them, what is it that they want more than anything? And I have to ask them, why are they lost? And maybe they could tell me <laughs> because that's usually what's happening. I have to just go back to the, to asking my characters their what they want. Yeah. Um, another great question about writing from Jolie is, does writing energize you or exhaust you? <laughs> or both? Uh, I know. <laughs> I think it's both. I think I love writing. Um, I also love have written, have having been written. I think what's that? This is a science saying of that or something. Like, um, I don't like rewriting. I can't stand rewriting. It's so torturous to me. I like to just throw. I I wish I could just throw it out. All book, all books have to be written, rewritten. No, nothing comes out perfect. But sometimes I'd like to just write the thing very quickly, the draft, and then not have to looking at look at it again. <laughs> but of course, I have to look at it, and that takes up it's that's a different part of my brain, and it's more strategic, and that to me is harder to work on. So, I exhaust. I I love writing. I love creating new worlds. I also find rewriting exhausting. <laughs> Great. Great. You sort of touched on this a little bit, um, but Melissa had a question. Do you have a specific process that you go through each time you write? Do you outline or do you just, it sounds like maybe you sit down and write, but is there sort of a standard way that you um, do research was another question that she had. And what, what does that look like for you? Yeah, um, I usually try to do this. I usually spend hopefully a few uh, months, like maybe two or three months or whatever, depending on deadlines. But I try to, if I have an idea, an idea comes to me, I have a vision. I'm like, oh, I have this image in my head of these two girls holding hands. What does that look like? What, what's their story? And so maybe I have that image and then I start asking questions of my characters. And this is all, I'm just writing it in a notebook. I'm just accumulating scenes and dialogue and what their names are and just kind of playing around with this idea, the story idea until this journal is full until I feel like I'm, I'm, you know, and this is including research, obviously. Um, and then once that's kind of like set up and filled up, then I use, um, then I write an outline 
but I don't stick to the outline very much. I'll write an outline and I don't look at it at all ever again. I just like to try to have an image of like what what the acts will look like or act one, act two, act three, or the ending. I have to know what my beginning, how I'm going to start up a work, a project and how it's gonna end. If I don't know the ending, then it's hard for me to write towards it. So I have to really kind of know what the ending is gonna look like. And then, then I start writing and then I give myself a deadline or if I have a deadline and then I write every day until, you know, a certain amount of words every day until I finish that deadline. And so I hit the, you know, I hit the amount of words I needed to hit. Um, and that's usually how I work for the most part. Mm -hmm. Great. We're getting a lot of great questions about the sort of process of writing. So you had mentioned um, that with Margot Sanchez, you wrote it in 90 days. Um, and Jacqueline asks, how long does it normally take you to write a book? So is that 90 days standard or was that an exceptionally fast um, first write, uh, first sort of process? Or... Uh, or what does that look like for you? And also, do you have to feel motivated to write? Or do you sort of force yourself to, <laughs> to sit down and do oh it? Oh, my God. The motivation. I think that's been my problem this whole couple of weeks. I can't motivate. But also, I feel like we're in a pandemic, and it's almost impossible to focus. So I have to be kind to myself, right? And um, so uh, um, 90 days is ridiculously easy. I mean, it's ridiculously a quick time to produce a, a draft. Um, so, but it's really how I learned how to write. <laughs> I, you know, I took a class with this uh, instructor here in LA called Al, his name is Al Watts. And he, he has this book called the 90 day novel. And it just literally gives you like each day, read, like read a snippet. And then he gives you like questions, how to answer. And I don't know, it was really the way I, I kind of worked. Cause I was just like, well, if I have a deadline and I have something to do every day, then I know I'll get it done. And so, um, so for now, do I write 90 days? I write drafts very quickly, but they're terrible. <laughs> they're first drafts. And first drafts are just to throw the idea up in, on the page and see what happens and let yourself be free, you know, write freely. Um, and that's really why I love that part, because then I can just write whatever I want. <laughs> you know, I'm not really thinking about like the outline I've created. I'm not really following the rules on, in the sense, I'm just like, this is a story and I'm gonna try to get it out of my head and put it on the page. And then when I, you know, when you look back on it, some of it is just a mess <laughs> and you have to throw away chapters and you have to rewrite stuff. And that takes up, it's just like, it's just a different uh, part of your brain, I feel. And so then um, that just takes up a lot of time. So I have to really like sit back and think think about it, think about it. And that just takes up way more time. But sometimes you don't have time. Sometimes you got to work fast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, a question from Angela is, did you have any teachers who encouraged you to write? And if so, how did they encourage you? And if not, are there ways you wish your teachers would have been helpful to encourage you as a writer? I did. I had an English teacher, Mr. Latimer in high school. And he was, um, he gave us an assignment to write some sort of short story. And I wrote a short story and I was such a, like I said, I was a really shy, quiet person. So I never said anything in that class. And when I wrote that short story and I submitted it to him, he was just like, where, who wrote, you wrote this? Like he was so in shock that I wrote something cause it was funny and he just didn't see it like me, like my personality that way. Cause I was quiet. And so then he was just like, oh, I see. <laughs> and he was in charge of the journal, like the school newspaper. And he just sort of forced me to, <laughs> to join the school newspaper. And I would, that was literally the beginning of my writing life because I learned how to interview people and do features and profiles and wrote profiles on students. And it really forced me out of being this super shy person and forced me into, you know, uh, focusing on someone else. And, and write. And so it, Mr. Latimer was the one person who, who, who did that, who saw something in me, saw that I had some sort of a gift and, and pushed me to just sort of develop it as much as possible. So I was lucky. <laughs> yeah. 
Great. Yeah, we're getting lots of good questions, guys. So keep adding them to the chat and uh, we'll, we'll make sure we can get through as many as we can. Um, we have two great questions. So I'm going to try to ask them together that both have to do with the idea of um, sort of where you live, where you're growing up and how that sort of influences you as a writer. So Kimberly asked, if you hadn't grown up and lived where you lived and how you lived, would you have still sort of followed the same path to being an author? And sort of along those same, same lines, Elizabeth asks, um, how do you think the environment uh, that we live in or grew up in impacts the work of an author? Oh, these are good questions, man. right? <laughs> <laughs> um, huh. I think for sure that wherever I would have grown up, I would have been influenced. It would have influenced my writing for sure, right? So if I, um, if I grew up in suburbia, I, you know, who knows? I might have still seen suburbia as a science fiction place, <laughs> you know, even if I grew up in it. So to me, my environment fully um, inspires me and puts like plants seeds in my head of how I'm going to write things. So, I mean, even though I live in Los Angeles, you know, if I, if I, my role is, a, is to be an observer, is to observe things, is to watch things. And so that literally, that's my job. I am supposed to pay attention. <laughs> and so if I'm paying attention, then I'm able to create stories from the things that I'm witnessing. And so right now, at this very moment, you, you know, our job is to pay attention. You know, we are witnessing unheard of things. <laughs> um, and I, and, you know, and I implore people to, to pay attention, to look, you know, these are things that might influence your writing, your artwork years from now, five years, 10 years from now, but it will. And so then I feel like I, I have to pay attention. Like I have to witness what's happening and it's going to inform my work, you know, maybe not now, but it will surely will in the future. So I do love that. I love, my job is to be observers. Like we are here to witness things and interpret it in an artistic way. So that's, you know, that's our job. Great. We're getting lots of good questions about what you were just saying, sort of reacting to this moment. Um, Numaris wants to know sort of, what do you think of today's racial justice movement? Does this influence how you write, who you write for, the characters you write about? Um, yeah, how does that impact your work as an author? Yes, um, I am a product of, of social experiments. I mean, the housing project, that was a, an, a social experiment, <laughs> you know, that we, you know, my parents brought in. You know, I come from, you know, my parents came from Puerto Rico. It's a colonized island. It's still a colonized island, you know, and they came to the U.S. to, to start a life but they were forced to leave an, a home, you know? And so, you know, all of those things influence the way I write. So even if I'm writing a story about a retelling of a Greek myth, in that story, I am writing about generational trauma. <laughs> in that story, I'm writing about Caribbean um, imp imperialism. I'm writing about imperialism, <laughs> about Caribbean history. Um, so although I'm writing about a story about love, young love or summer love, I'm also writing about, um, what it's like to be Brown, an Afro Latino young, you know, young teenager, what it's, what life is like to live in a city in a place that is not meant for you, you know, that there's not a welcoming space, right? But we're, we're, we're carving it, we're carving our our room, we're carving in space. So all these things I, I write about all the time. And so the things that are happening now are the things are, they're not new in the sense, in the sense that if you follow history, we've seen this happening, right? <laughs> it's new to a lot of other people who never had to deal with any of the things that we've had to deal with, we being people of color. But for my family and for generations in my in my history, this is not new. So all of those things influence the work. Whether I'm writing a coming of age story that's a young love, or I'm writing a disturbing dark horror story. 
<laughs> whatever it is, it all it all feeds into my my writing. <laughs> I'm gonna get some water. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, take a water break. Um, <laughs> Giselle has asked, is there a book you enjoyed writing the most? I know we're not supposed to have, it's like picking a favorite child or a favorite student, right? But do you have a favorite? Oh, um, I, I do. I, you know, maybe I just love Never Look Back. I don't know why. And I think it's because I wrote it during a time when I needed to find love. <laughs> like I needed hope. Um, you know, Hurricane Maria happened and, and it, it helped, you know, I was missing an uncle. My uncle went missing at the time because he was like 80 years old and Hurricane Maria happened and we couldn't get to him and we couldn't figure out a way of getting to him. And it was madness. And I had to take to social media and Twitter and ask people to help me. And, um, and our government failed and continues to fail. And so I was in a really dark place at the time. I felt really hopeless. And so I had to find a way of, of, I didn't know what to write. And I was just like, how do I, what do I write? You know, and I had to write towards love and I had to write towards hope. And it's so, although Never Look Back was a hard write, a hard book to write because it was full of really dark periods of, you know, depression and sadness, but it really did bring me back to hope. It, it helped me, it, may, it reminded me that, that young people are, are falling in love still <laughs> and they're finding each other and they're saving each other. So, and that's what I need to write. So that's my favorite for that's now. Great. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of, we've gotten a couple of questions. Um, Jeffrey wants to know how, how many books you are currently working on. Ashley wants to know, are you currently working on a book and can we get any sneak peeks if you are? <laughs> These are all, Oh man. Well, Okay, uh, I can say, oh, well, this is fun. I, I, you know, I wrote a short story. It's an anthology, it's for an anthology, Empire Strikes Back anthology, Star Wars anthology. And that's coming out in, I think next month. And so I, that was really cool. And it's, um, it's called From a, po From a Certain Point of View, Empire Strikes Back. And so I got to write a, a, new, a new character that's set in the world of Empire Strikes Back world. And that was, that was literally my, my favorite uh, nerdy moment of my life because I, I was such a, nerd, a Star Wars fan. So for me to be able to write in that world was really fun. And that comes out soon. And then I wrote um, a comic book, a short comic book that is for DC Comics. And it's, um, it's Wonder Woman of History. And so it's all these like historical badass women from history or current history. And um, I was able to write about AOC and how she's really an amazing politician and women. And I wrote about her history. And that's a comic book that's going to come out, a comic book anthology that comes out soon too, next month. So those are two things that are coming out. I am writing... Um, two books. I have a young adult book that should come out next year. Uh, if we could all just light a candle and pray that I finish it because I am, I'm in the rewriting process and, and it's really hard. <laughs> so that hopefully comes out next year. And then I think that's all I could share for right now. There's some, a couple of good things that are happening that are going to be amazing, but I can't share it because I'll get killed. Like they'll send someone out here to destroy me or something <laughs> we'll just have to stay tuned and see what comes next um tracy from los angeles our pal tracy um wants to know if you are interested in writing for the big screen or having any of your books be made into a movie or tv show oh tracy um sure <laughs> i want i want my books to be made into into movies or tv shows i mean i could easily see it in the big screen um, I'm actually, because I am trying to learn something new, I'm taking a TV writing class that's, uh, that's just started this past, this past year, like not this past year, I should say this past week. And so I'm, I'm learning how to do that. I guess it's, it's a whole new game. Like, I don't know how to do that, but also I didn't know how to write comic books. And then I, I learned how to do that. So, um, I'm just trying to 
see what that's like because it's always good to just learn something new. But yeah, um, I, I would love to see my books made into into movies or TV shows. Um, I can't say anything about that, but you know, maybe it maybe it'll happen. Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> then we'll have the age old debate of which is better, the movie or the book. That. Exactly. What's your general preference? Do you always read the read the book before you see the movie? I do. But you know what's really good, and I'll give this as an example, is that Essie Hinton's The Outsider is a good book, and the movie is a good movie. Like, I've seen it twice this past year, because my teenage daughter has only seen the movie, and she loves it so much, and it's such a good movie. So. Um. So Ariana asked a question. What is the first book you remember reading that made you emotional, that brought up feelings? Ariana, my niece's name. Um, the first book that made me emotional, like made me cry. She just asked emotional. So I guess it could be laughter or tears or. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the first book that made me feel seen or somewhat was um, Esmeralda Santiago's When I Was Puerto Rican. Because that's like, um, when that book, it's a memoir book um, written by a Puerto Rican. She grew up on the island and she talked about what it was, what life was like on the island before she had to go to New York or, you know, move to New York. And it's such a powerful book and it's beautiful and magical and disturbing in some ways. And I love that book so much. I loved it so much that I wrote an essay for the New York Times about it. Um, and so Esmeralda Santiago, that was like a big deal when she, that book came out. It was like, it was profound to read something that's so, you know, that sort of wasn't about my life at all because I didn't grow up in the Puerto Rico, but it made me reckon, it made me think about my parents' life and what they might have had to go through at the time. And that helped me understand them more. So yeah, when I was Puerto Rican. Uh, Esmeralda, Esmeralda Santiago, who's still writing books. <laughs> We're getting close to the end of our time together. So the last question that I want to close out with today is, can you recommend three books that you think folks tuning in should check out other than your own work, of course? <laughs> yeah, um, I have them right here. Let's see. Okay, so this one just came out uh, just like a couple of weeks ago. And it's Blaze Rap Games by... Um, by Amparo Ortiz. And it is a uh, young adult, but it skews a little bit younger, but it's about uh, like uh, dragon racing, almost like Olympic dragon racing category with uh, nations representing their, you know, dra you know representing like uh, athletes representing their nations. So there's a Puerto Rican girl who represents Puerto Rico and races a dragon. And it's really cool adventure, awesome. So that's one, Blaze Wrath Games. And then this anthology just came out. And yeah, and it's called um, Come On In. And it's uh, 15 stories about immigration and, and finding home. Um, Addy Alsaid uh, was the editor. And there's some really great short stories about the immigration experience. Um, I highly recommend it. I do have a story in here, but you know, the other stories are just, you know, they're amazing, you know. So this is really cool. And then the last book I want you guys to pick up is um, by Brandy Colbert. And it's The Only Black Girls in Town. And this is a middle grade book. And it's it's gotten some star reviews. And Brandy is such a great uh, author. She's written a lot of young adults. This is her first middle grade. Um, and it's really great. I really love it. It's so much fun. So pick that out. And those are the three books that I think you guys should uh, add to your collection. <laughs> Great, great, thanks so much. Um, well, I hope everyone uh, will join us again for the next Book Up at Home author visit we have. We're gonna be doing these once a month, so we have lots of great folks lined up for you to connect with. Our next event will be on November 11th, same time, four o'clock, um, and we'll be with Rita Williams Garcia, who is a great uh, middle grade author, and you guys, I think, will really enjoy connecting with her as well. Um, if we have any teachers- there you go. We're accidentally continuing a, a Bronx theme. Um, and we got a lot of notes of we've got a bunch of people watching from the Bronx right now. So we have a lot of Bronx love. Um, 
And any teachers that are watching today as well, I wanted to encourage you to sign up for the National Book Awards Teen Press Conference, which will feature the five finalists in young people's literature for the National Book Award this year. That's another free virtual event happening on November 16th. So we really look forward to connecting with you uh, in future events, whether it's here at Book Up at Home or other, other events. So thanks again, Lillian, for joining us and helping us kick off this this first uh, event, and it was really great to have you and hear from you and um, learn more about your life as a writer and reader. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. Thank you so much, and I'm I'm, I'm going to have to tune into the other ones because this is going to be really cool. We'll see you there. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>